Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Scotus Cast. I'm your host, Nick Garfinkel, on behalf of the Faculty Division of the Federalist Society. On June 13th and 15th, 2022, the Supreme Court decided Dinez P. v. United States and Yesleta del Sur Pueblo v. Texas, respectively. Both cases dealt with issues of Native American law. In Dinez P., a 6-3 court ruled that the Double Jeopardy Clause does not bar successive prosecutions of distinct offenses arising from a single act. In a case where a man was prosecuted in both federal, district court, and a court of Indian offenses. In Yisleta del Sur, the court ruled 5 4 that the state of Texas could not control gambling activities on the lands of the Yisleta del Sur Pueblo native tribe. Joining today to discuss these cases and their implications are Anthony J. Ferrati of Council and Spencer Fain LLP and Jennifer Weddell, shareholder at Greenberg Traurig. Thank you very much. Uh, AJ Ferrati with Spencer Fain here in the Oklahoma City office, and it's great to be with you. Um, we're going to just jump right in because uh, we got a lot to cover. Uh, Jennifer and I have talked a couple of times about this, and uh, there's there's plenty to, to chat about um, today. Three cases from the Supreme Court have come out in the past few weeks related to tribal law issues. And uh, we're we're ready to discuss them. Um, I'm going to start with Isleta. Um, we've discussed this a couple of times. We had a, we had a teleforum on this. I did a follow up on this case after argument occurred, and this is one that really kind of touches on a a state tribal relationship that really revolves around gaming and. The state of Texas had uh, had control uh, of the trust, trust lands, the tribal trust lands in this case for a number of years, told the federal government they no longer felt that that was an appropriate uh, situation. And so there was a statute and, and a fight over how that what that language should look like in the 1980s. A Supreme Court decision called Cabazon, referred to as Cabazon, came about roughly around the same time as the Enactment Act of the trust land relationship between the federal government and the tribe. Uh, and, and really, this, this case revolves around one couple of sections, actually, uh, of, uh, of that arrangement with the federal government. And the real question, as the majority put it, is, is the question in this case one about prohibition? Does prohibition mean the same as regulate, or does regulate mean something different? And there was a very broad discussion in the Supreme Court at oral argument about these two concepts, and really a question about whether or not the Supreme Court should use what they generally do in this situation, or should they follow more of the Cabazon focus on this issue? And where we came out with a Justice Gorsuch opinion, and I'm going to count again here because I need to make sure that Justice Breyer was on it. Um, and so we had Justice Gorsuch in the majority with Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Barrett, Justice Barrett. Um, and the decision is, yeah, the tribe was right and the state of Texas was incorrect in their assessment. And with the question of whether or not since the state of Texas allows bingo, does that trigger immediately that under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the bingo that occurs on tribal lands, can that be regulated uh, away from Texas? Now, Texas says, no, we only allowed this gaming to occur on uh, a for nonprofits within churches, Knights of Columbus, those sort of things. Um, 
furthermore, they said what the tribe's doing isn't real bingo. They're, they're you know, they're slot machines, um, but they follow electronic bingo protocols uh, to resemble exactly what is going on in that situation. Um, Texas didn't really have a tough, ha- had a tough leg to stand on in this, just being candid. Um, Lenora Pettit, on behalf of the Texas AG's office, did an amazing job. Um, she actually argued this incredibly well and made this a tough case. And it is a tough case based on the fact that the decision was five to four. But at the end of the day, um, the court, Justice Gorsuch, used that Cabazon model of regulate versus uh, restrict and and sided with the tribe. He, he said it would make no sense to have 107A and 107B in there if they didn't mean something. And if you look at other uh, bills, other laws that were passed around tribal issues at the same time, they looked very differently in structure. And so at the end of the day, uh, the court sided with the tribe this is going to be remanded. It's going to be remanded for, for review. There's other issues that will be ongoing in this case. Um, we'll, we'll see where those pan out. Um, but, but at the end of the day, uh, the tribe may continue their, their bingo, uh, electronic bingo systems there in the state. The, um, the, the dissent was a little bit interesting on this one. Chief Justice Roberts did something very similar to what the um, uh, what the state of Texas did is he focused on 107A of the statute rather than, and, and he does mention 107B, so I want to be fair on that, but he, he kind of does that as, a, as an aside. Uh, 107C is mentioned as well in there as an aside, but he doesn't delve into those significantly. And at the end of the day, my opinion is that without addressing 107B and focusing on 107B and its relationship with 107A, um, you just can't get to the conclusion of the dissenters in this case. Um, we also had Denesby. Denesby um, was up before the court, and, and this one is a little bit of a different different case. This, this, uh, Mr. Denesby, and, and I know Jennifer has a lot of the backstory on this one. Um, and it, and she shared it with me and I know she'll probably share some of that with you here in a moment, but it, it, this is a gruesome case and this is a difficult case, um, from the, when, when you dive into this and, I, and, and one of the questions I had for Jennifer, as I was diving into it is, you know, where are the where is the law enforcement on this? And the answer is there's really not any law enforcement. This is a 500,000 acre reservation, and you may only have one or two police officers policing the whole thing. So it can take two to three hours at times even to get to where a crime occurred. Um, but Mr. Denespi was uh, assaulted and raped uh, another tribal citizen. Uh, I believe they were both Navajo um, from my fan and Jennifer's nodding. Yes. So thank you. Um, but they were on the Ute mountain Ute reservation and um, they had been to the casino there um, on the reservation. Um, and then the, the incident occurred that led to this issue. Now you have two different situations. You have the, the tribal court issues. You have um, Mr. Dennis, he was also charged after he got out of jail for his tribal offenses. Um, he went and was prosecuted by the federal government in the district of Colorado, um, much longer penalty than what he got from the tribe, which I believe was about six months. The, the difficult question in this case is the tribal courts uh, decades ago, um, many, many tribes did not actually have, the, they didn't have courts of their own. They didn't have a way to actually uh, provide justice within the tribes. And so the federal government at one point took it upon themselves to actually create what are today known as CFR courts. Uh, there's only about five of them in existence anymore, um, but the Ute Mountain Utes operate one of those. So again, they've got 500,000 acres and uh, they, they have, I believe, a, a very small number of members 
of the tribe. And, and so it, it just really isn't economic for them to actually create their own judicial system. So the federal government comes in to supplement that. And that's where the question Mr. Denespi brings up comes into play. He, he says that these CFR courts are operated by the federal government. The federal government hires the judges. They hire the prosecutors. And in fact, even though the tribal law is employed in the matter, uh, there's an over, overarching uh, CFR, a, a federal regulation that really kind of restricts um, how this case is prosecuted. And so he claimed that that you had the federal court prosecuting him in the tribal matter and the federal court coming over the top in the other in, in the in the federal case uh, using the Major Crimes Act in that instance. Um, I'm a little surprised by the outcome. So I, I listening to oral argument, um, I honestly thought that this was going to go Mr. Denespi's way. Uh, it did not. Um, and and I'm, I'm a little conflicted on this one because I think on the policy issues, I actually agree with the majority's decision. I think it was the right decision from a policy perspective. That said, we have Justice Gorsuch uh, in dissent. This was a Justice Barrett opinion. And we had Justice Gorsuch in dissent um, really kind of taking a deeper dive into what CFR courts are, how they're constructed, what they look like. Um, and uh, so I'm with, I, I appreciate, again, the tribal perspective, uh, uh, the, the, the tribes win on this, right? The tribes want to continue their justice. The Ute Mountain Utes would not be able to process justice if it weren't for these CFR courts. So I think from a policy perspective, this is the right answer. I, I tend to lean a little bit more with Justice Gorsuch on the law. I, th I think he kind of gets it right on the law here. And um, he, he dives into it. He focuses on Wheeler. He says that this is not a dual jurisdiction issue. He focuses on it in a much different and much more significant way than, than the majority does. And I think that that leads to um, some of the conflict. And I see some of his consternation over Denespi, I think, uh, in a third case that I'm just going to lightly mention because I know that Jennifer and I will be involved in another um, another teleforum on Castro Huerta next week. But Castro Huerta also has come out since this teleforum was announced. And um, you, you can see a little bit further some of the frustration that Justice Gorsuch had. We had uh, a fairly uh, short Justice Kavanaugh opinion in that in the majority on that one, 5-4. Uh, Justice Gorsuch writing in the minority in, in dissent wrote a very extensive and lengthy opinion um, countering what Justice Kavanaugh did. Um, I, I really introduce Castro Huerta into this really because all three of these cases are, are have some play together. They're involved um, they, they're, and I know Jennifer has some thoughts on, on how they're all integrated with each other. But a couple of things that I want to talk about um, overall is I have had a number of people reach out to me about, um, so does this mean Justice Barrett is anti-tribe, or does this mean Justice Gorsuch is pro-tribe, or, or a, similar questions along those veins. And I think that the answer that I, that I have to give is, I look at these on a case by case basis. I look at the facts, I look at the law, and I'm not a, I don't wear a black robe, but I have to believe these people that wear black robes look at these in a very similar vein. We had Justice Barrett in, in Isalta uh, very clearly um, in, in dissent. She did not support uh, the Indian gaming. She sided with the state of Texas. However, in Denespi, she took what arguably is the pro tribe position. In that case, Justice Gorsuch didn't take what was arguably the pro-tribe position in that case, he took the pro-defendant position in that case. Um, Justice Barrett was in the majority in Castro Huerta. Justice Gorsuch was not. I, I think you can glean trends on some of these justices, but I don't think that it's fair or appropriate to really label anybody pro-tribe or anti-tribe uh, unless they've actually come out and explicitly raised uh, a pro-tribe or an anti-tribe um, 
opinion on, you know, that can be con viewed as consistent. Um, so uh, that that's how I have the process here to start out. Uh, I know Jennifer has a little bit more, and I know we'll have a little bit of a dialogue after that. So thank you, AJ. And I'll tap in here and talk first about Isleta del Sur. Uh, this is really a textualism case, uh, whereas, as AJ explained, Justice Gorsuch writing for the majority follows the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians framework, a 1987 US Supreme Court case that held the state of California could not regulate tribal gaming, uh, then also bingo, um, <clears throat> could not regulate bingo, uh, and that the tribe was conducting that economic activity pursuant to its inherent sovereignty as a nation state and that the tribe was free to do that unless and until Congress limited that sovereignty in some way. Shortly thereafter, Congress did exactly that and enacted the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988 that put parameters around how tribes could engage in gaming, including uh, giving states something of a veto power. And really the less of a veto power, but more a, are we gonna play baseball or not power, right? So. Under IGRA, tribes can engage in gaming, entering into a compact with the state that sets out the parameters of what they're going to do. States can also make the decision that no gaming of any sort will be allowed, and then the tribe can't game either. Um, but conversely, if a, if a state regulates gaming and allows gaming activities within its borders, then tribes can also game. And really the question in Isleta del Sur was whether uh, because Texas did not prohibit bingo and instead expressly authorizes bingo subject to its regulations, whether those regulatory restrictions would also apply to the tribe. And the court said, no. So are we gonna play baseball state of Texas? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Texas, you don't get to set what the strike zone is. Um, if we're playing baseball, then the tribe gets to set their own strike zone. Um, again, I think that's very consistent with the court's precedent, um, with the plain text of the statute, and really the whole case hinged on whether uh, the word, uh, you know, what is a prohibition versus what is a regulation. And uh, clearly we're not getting into the business of the state imposing its own regulatory regime on the tribe, once there's a yes or no to be in a particular type of gaming activity, then uh, it's up to the tribe to regulate from there. Um, in terms of uh, Denespi, uh, again, I think this is an important case about, as all of these cases are, what is the role of tribes in our federalism? And as, as many of you who are tuned into this webinar know, that has long been a pendulum in federal policy. Um, ranging from war, outright war with tribes, uh, to forced assimilation of tribes, to uh, restoration of sovereignty, to termination of tribes, and now uh, to the so-called self-determination era, which we've been in since the Nixon administration, uh, where the evinced policy of both the executive and the legislative branch uh, has been to support tribal self-determination, tribal self-governance, the strengthening of tribal institutions to be able to make their own laws and be governed by them and provide services to their citizens. Uh, Denespi um, is within that framework. Uh, as AJ described, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, my longtime client here in Colorado, is a very, very poor, large land-based tribe the median income is less than $25,000 a year per household. It's hundreds of miles from the nearest uh, urban and metropolitan areas and uh, about a nine hour drive from the federal courthouse here in Denver. Um, so it's very hard to get access to justice. Uh, another um, guidepost I wanna give everyone as we talk about this is what is the general status of criminal jurisdiction in Indian country? Uh, it's been routinely referred to as a maze of injustice and also an indefensible morass. And why is that? Uh, because the US Supreme Court has routinely just made it up in the Indian uh, criminal justice context. 
Uh, and the problem really finds its, the modern problem really finds its roots in 1978 when the court ruled in a case called Oliphant versus Suquamish tribe that tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians was inconsistent with our status as conquered people. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> Um, so you have a court in 1978 following the height of the civil rights era saying you can't have jurisdiction over non-natives because that's inconsistent with your status as conquered people. Um, <clears throat> that means the law enforcement closest uh, to the community, the law enforcement with most observation opportunity, uh, responsible to the public, cannot uh, prosecute non-native uh, offenders. For years, there had been a lack of prosecution in Indian country because in an 1885 appropriations rider, Congress enacted the so-called Major Crimes Act, which gave the federal government exclusive jurisdiction to prosecute certain crimes by non-Indians occurring in Indian country. Over the years, the federal government has been derelict in its duty in prosecuting those crimes. So, uh, and I know we, we have some, some folks uh, on the webinar who are very expert in this, including Tom Getty, who actually sat on the Indian Law and Order Commission. Um, U.S. attorney's offices decline major crimes prosecution in Indian country, generally at a rate of about 62%, and it's even higher in cases of sexual violence. Uh, U.S. attorneys just are not prosecuting Indian country-based crimes, and tribes can't prosecute those Indian country-based crimes. What tribes, uh, what certain poor tribes have, as A.J. mentioned, is, is a vestige, an administrative court, a so-called CFR court, which are actually organs created by exclusively by the Department of the Interior. And Justice Gorsuch's dissent does a great job laying out the tortured history of CFR courts, which were a tool of assimilation. Uh, an executive branch entity, the Department of the Interior, took unto itself the power to create a court that was uh, judge and jury, um, taking legislative, uh, executive, and judicial power all unto itself to create this entity called a CFR court. And those courts were designed to prosecute so-called Indian offenses, mostly trying to prosecute religious exercise by natives, going after medicine men and traditional cultural practices um, in a way that is deeply offensive uh, to Justice Gorsuch, uh, who's maintained a strong focus on the freedom of, of exercise. And um, congratulations to AJ and the Kennedy case result. I want him to talk about that as well. But, um, you know, uh, Justice Gorsuch is very consistent in his uh, efforts to safeguard religious practice, and I think quite rightly says um, these CFR courts were all wrong to begin with. Um, but uh, the majority in Justice Barrett recognized that um, what, are most, what were most certainly lemons uh, for tribes in CFR courts, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe has now made lemonade uh, with its CFR court. Uh, and this was a question that came up at oral argument. Uh, we represented not only the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, but other tribes uh, with CFR courts as amici before the court. And we argued that the tribes have really appropriated these courts as their own. These courts now prosecute tribal offenses. The prosecutor and judges are selected uh, by the tribal community, still subject to federal approval. And the courts are run with federal resources because the tribes don't have their own resources. Uh, but these courts typically prosecute tribal offenses that have been adopted into the tribal code. And that's exactly what happened with Mr. Denespi, a very violent sexual offender who followed his ex-girlfriend hundreds of miles from the Navajo Nation to the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation where she took refuge. Uh, he brutally raped her in a home to the point she could not stand or walk, she crawled to get help. And he hid in a shed in the neighbor's yard for 13 hours and was at large, uh, violent and armed in the community for three days until law enforcement showed up and arrested him on a tribal charge. Uh, under the Indian Civil Rights Act, the most uh, that anybody can be prosecuted for in these CFR courts uh, was one year and a $5,000 fine. 
to get a plea deal, um, the really the maximum amount of time the tribe could get uh, for him to be in jail in the CFR court was six months, but that was six months. This very violent offender was off the streets, not in the community and not endangering anyone else. As AJ mentioned, uh, later he was prosecuted uh, for the, the rape charge uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, but that was more than a year uh, after the crime had been committed and six months after he had completely served his sentence for the tribal offense. And Justice Barrett, again, uh, in a strict kind of textualist moment says, well, what's the source of sovereign authority that was prosecuted here? The offense is the tribe's offense. It's one that they created under tribal law. And the United States has a very different offense that's created under the United States code. So there's no double jeopardy here. Uh, and I think Justice Barrett heeded uh, the consistent refrain from all the amici in the case that if the court were to have taken away this, the one minimally effective tool that the tribe has to get people in jail and deter violent conduct, that would have been an incredible hit to public safety um, amongst the poorest of the poor. And it would especially have been a hit to tribe's ability to protect citizens from particularly violence against women. Um, sexual violence in Indian country, domestic violence in Indian country are really the number one crimes. Uh, and because of Oliphant, are areas where the tribe has really the least ability to keep its citizens safe because the offenders are almost always non-natives. Um, and that moves us into Castro Huerta. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, there I'd say it's a very um, kind of different uh, approach. But be before we go down that vein, I think just analyzing Isleta del Sur and Denespi. These are strict textualist approaches that um, seek to manage the tribe's expectations that look to, you know, what is the sovereign legislative action at stake here, whether it's the federal government speaking in the Recognition Act for Isleta del Sur, or whether it's the Ute Mountain Ute tribe defining the offense uh, in Denespi. It's, you know, creates bright line rules, it's easy to follow, uh, and it doesn't uh, create different policy balancing tests to try to achieve some different outcome determinative results. So for Indian country, these two are huge wins. Um, so I want to kind of cabin them and give AJ a chance to further reflect. Um, I, I thank Jennifer and I, and I, uh, a couple of things that she mentioned there that, that I think are, are fairly important. Um, and I guess in disclosure, uh, uh, I wrote an amicus brief in Castro Huerta. I believe that she did as well. Um, so we, we do have that opposite sides. Um, but, um, but one of the things that she touched on about justice in, in the tribal area and the federal government um, failing to, to meet its, its duties, I guess, in that sense, the, the duties that they've assumed, um, we wrote about that in, in our brief. And we talked about how now 50% of all uh, federal homicide prosecutions are now in Oklahoma. Um, you know, in a statistical sense, Oklahoma has now become the federal murder capital of the country. Um, but the problem is that when you look at that and you try to match that with uh, what I'll call lesser major crimes, if you will, um, burglaries, larcenies, thefts, you're not seeing the same pre precipitous climb. And it's causing difficulties uh, in some of these communities because you're not seeing similar prosecutions, candidly, just because the federal government can't handle them yet. And, and maybe they will, and maybe we'll get up to speed. But it, it is, continues to be an issue. And I know it's an issue that that uh, Jennifer and I share is that all communities should be safe and all communities should be properly policed. Um, going back to uh, Justice Gorsuch in Denespi, and I, I, I think it's important to kind of read this into the presentation because um, it, it circles it back around. It, it, he, he says, in these proceedings, however, Mr. Denespi has not questioned whether the Court of Indian Offenses is statutorily authorized, nor has he questioned whether the Constitution permits executive officials rather than a judge and jury to, tr to try him for crimes. 
Accordingly, those questions, long lingering and incredibly still unanswered, remain for another day. Uh, I don't know, Jennifer, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if he thought that there was some questions in conference that may have led to a different result if Mr. Denespi had actually focused maybe on a couple of these areas. Um, yeah, I, th I think that almost definitely is the case. And there's several places in both the majority and the dissent where I, I think the justices resisted the invitation to raise and knock down arguments that hadn't been made uh, by Mr. Denespi in the proceedings at the Tenth Circuit. Uh, or in the proceedings below. Uh, and I think really the court has to do that. And they also were clear that they weren't, this wasn't a blessing on CFR courts <laughs> uh, by any stretch no. by Justice Barrett. Uh, and I think Justice Gorsuch highlights just how problematic those CFR courts are. Um, but it also, I think importantly left the door open for uh, creative solutions here, you know, the tribe using this federal vehicle uh, effectively as a tribal court. And that was mentioned in oral argument. You know, Justice Kagan asked uh, Denespi's counsel directly, so do you think the tribe's suffering from false consciousness? You know, clearly they think these are their courts. And uh, his answer was, well, I think that the Department of the Interior should just direct fund all the tribal courts. And that would be great, but that's not the world we mm -hmm. live in. Uh, so, um, you know, I think they, they're they continuing to leave open, you know, what are the structures that could work for effective policing in Indian country and recognizing that the Department of the Interior may well may very well have a role to play in that. Um, and that this is, you know, really a very narrow slice of the universe. It's most prosecutions are not taking place in CFR courts, but for some very poor rural places, these are really the only uh, access to criminal justice that many people practically have. And it's it's one minor tool to keep communities safe. And the court just was not willing to take that away, uh, which the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe is very, very grateful for. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUS Cast. SCOTUS Cast is a project of the Federalist Society a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 